Okay, in the last video, we talked about a couple of bad answers to the knowledge condition question, which is how much information does the seller need to make sure that the buyer has in order to be acting as a ethical salesperson? So in this video, we're going to talk about Holly's actual answer to this. So remember that um, the key question here is whether or not the buyer has enough information to decide if the purchase is going to be uh, beneficial, if it's going to be in their interests. Um, so Holly gives three things that you're basically going to have to give, uh, or three kind of uh, guidelines to spelling out this. So the first is uh, it needs to be non-deceptive, right? And you need to give pretty much as much information, or it needs to be pretty complete. Now, what counts as complete is going to depend, and we'll come back to that in a second. And the third is you need to communicate it in a way that the person can actually understand. So, and that's especially going to be the case when you're talking about some piece of technology or something where the buyer can be expected to not really um, fully understand uh, the details, which are important in um, any uh uh, detailed way. So before I talk a little bit more about each of these, um, or at least, well, I'll say a little bit about especially this one, um, The it is worth noting that th there's not going to be like a hard and fast requirement. It's going to depend on a lot of stuff. Uh, one, it's going to depend on you know, what you know about the buyer's needs and their desires. Um, it's going to depend, as you will see in a second, uh, it's going to depend on the kind of industry you're in. Um, selling cars, you know, where we're talking about high value, very complex products, is probably going to be different than um, selling, you know, tacos at the local taco showroom. So it's going to depend on that. It's going to depend on various characteristics of the buyer. Uh, and lots and lots of other factors. And, you know, that should seem right to you, right? Because this is the real world, right? That's, th those are the kinds of things that can differ between people and uh, can influence sort of whether or not different kinds of people are going to be able to have voluntary, you know, truly voluntary exchanges. Because remember, that's what we want. All right. Uh, the first thing we need to do as a salesperson is avoid deception. So there's a couple ways you can deceive. Uh, the obvious way and, you know, the bad salesperson way is false statements, right? If you straight up lie and just say material false things, this car will go 5,000 miles an hour, right? That is not cool. That's not going to be helpful. That's not going to get anybody anywhere close to a voluntary transaction. But more importantly, and this is where, you know, well, think more things happen in the real world, right? Uh, n no half-truths or no using a truth to answer a question, but in with the intent to deceive them. So Holly has a nice example in there. Uh, he's got several nice examples, but one is, uh, you know, a buyer that asks the, the seller, like, well, is the co car odometer accurate? Um, and the seller, who, of course, has been rolling back the odometer to make it look like the car has been used less than it actually has, the seller says, well, it's uh, illegal to tamper with the odometer, which is, of course, not an answer to the question. So there's plenty of ways in which you can tell true, you can say only true things, but still be misleading and still be deceiving. And so deception for the knowledge condition here has to include both, you know, material lies, you know, misrepresentation, saying false stuff, but also saying true stuff in a way or in a context or in response to a question uh, with the intention of making it harder for the buyer to understand uh, what she needs to understand. Um, one thing to note, and it's not exactly clear how he wants to deal with this, but puffery, not in crisp sense, but in the regular sense of just sort of uh, natural expected um, uh, exaggeration. That sort of stuff probably can be uh, included on, on Holly's view, or some of that can be okay, you know, because we can kind of expect that the um, your average consumer is going to be able to uh, recognize that when the seller tells them that this is the greatest lip gloss in the history of lip gloss, that that's a bit of puffery and that they should not take that terribly seriously. Okay, 
so there's probably some room for puffery, but it's an interesting question um, where exactly to find that room. You know, so what are the limits? And again, it's going to probably depend on the on the, the uh, a lot of features of the situation and and of the customer. Um, one thing to make note of is you know sort of uh, dealing with more vulnerable customers like underage folks or uh, the elderly. You know where your cognitive abilities begin to decline. Um, they may be more vulnerable to uh, puffery and exaggeration. And so if you're dealing with somebody like that, there actually might be a higher or you know more of a responsibility to not engage in puffery than you know with your ordinary per, your ordinary consumer. Okay, so. Holly does give us a couple of uh, guidelines to help us figure out uh, where to draw the line, because again, it's going to be a bit contextual. So the first thing he says, and this is something that gets him into trouble that we'll talk about in the next video, uh, some objections that people raise to him. Uh, but the first thing he says is uh, that the salesperson should ask herself, well, what would I want to know if I were considering buying this product? And, you know, so the idea is you're supposed to put yourself into the customer's shoes, basically, and say, OK, well, if I was in their shoes, what what exactly would I need to know to make a, uh, you know, a reasonably informed decision about this? Now, you can see that that on its own is not going to be a very good uh, way of approaching this, because while it does get the right it has the right motivation, the putting yourself in the other person's shoes kind of thing, um, there's features of the or you know some facts about the salesperson are going to make her not the right model so for one you know the salesperson is usually going to be like uh way more knowledgeable uh i can't spell now knowledgeable <laughs> whatever you heard me say it uh way more knowledgeable than the consumer so you know, if you know all the ins and outs of your industry and all how all the different products vary in like really subtle ways um, that matter to you as a member of the industry, you're probably going to have way more detailed questions uh, and need to know more than your kind of average person off the street. So um, one, for example, um, if my friend who, you know, she's a, a, a professional wine person. She has all these certifications and is a well-trained wine taster and all that. Um, if she and I go to the, to the, the wine shop, she's going to need to know all this crazy stuff, like, uh, you know, stuff about the, the location of the vineyard and, you know, particular features of the kinds of grapes used and, you know, who the winemaker was and what style are they using and how long did they keep the grapes on the lees and, you know, what kind of barrel did they use to age it in and what kind of wood was the barrel made of and how long was it in the barrel and I can promise you she can go for a very long time with these kinds of questions, whereas I just need to know, is this going to go with pasta? Is this going to go with a taco? And is this going to get me drunk? Right. So different consumers are going to have different kinds of needs. And since, you know, but she being a wine salesperson, you know, is going to have way more detailed knowledge and way more detailed questions. So she's going to need to know way more than I am. And so that's a good reason for not modeling the salesperson or uh, using the salesperson's kind of thought, thinking about what they would need as the model for the, the customer. The better version uh, that Holly gets to, and there's a couple other problems, by the way, with this one, uh, but let's not worry about those for a second or for the moment. Uh, the, the main view that Holly gets to is to say that um, really what you need to do is ask yourself, what would a reasonable person need to know in order to make a decision about whether to buy this product? Um, and a reasonable person, and I'll get to this in just a second, uh, but a reasonable person is this kind of fiction that we use in the law and often in ethics where we're just kind of asking about um, kind of the average person, right? So the reasonable person, you can start off as thinking about like the person off the street, right? Uh, or the, you know, the average person. It's different contexts you might want to require a bit more than that, uh, but we can bring that up if we need to uh, when we talk about this elsewhere. So the reasonable person, you know, the question is, what kind of knowledge, 
does the reasonable person need in order to make an informed choice about whether to buy this product? Um, and it should be, by the way, not the reasonable person in general, but kind of the real reasonable customer. And it's the reasonable p customer um, buying this kind of thing. So you're going to have different standards that are going to apply. Um, and you can imagine cases, uh, one might be that are, uh, sorry, you can imagine cases which are going to differ. So for example, uh, somebody who's just an ordinary computer buyer, right? Uh, can I get on the internet? Can I do my papers? Can I check my email? Those are the kind of things you're going to need to know, right? Whereas somebody who's like a hardcore computer gamer, uh, they're going to need to know, you know, like the clock speed, the of the CPU, the cache sizes, you know, the speed of the bus, all sorts of stuff that the ordinary person's not going to need to know. And so if you're selling computers, you know, just like at your, like, I don't know, your local, uh, where do they sell computers? I don't know. I guess Best Buy does, right? Uh, so like, you know, a place that sells to ordinary people, uh, you know, you can, you're, you're taking as your reasonable person, kind of the average person that walks in off the street. Whereas if you're at a specialty computer stop uh, that sells to like gamers, you're a reasonable person. You know, you're going to assume that the person walking in the door is going to need to know way more information than you would if you were just selling at the Best Buy. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things that are helpful here about the idea of a reasonable person, right? A reasonable person is not just a lump. They're not just an empty head that walks in. You can expect that a reasonable person is going to take some responsibility for themselves. They're going to need to have, they're going to take some effort to comparison shop. They're going to take some effort to determine what they need. Um, and they're going to take some effort to bring up the kinds of things that are important to them. So in other words, if you are a salesperson and you have in your mind, here's kind of what a reasonable person would walk into my store uh, needing to know and having already informed themselves, then you don't have to tell them the stuff that you can expect they already would have informed themselves. And if somebody walks into your store and hasn't done that kind of stuff, you know, they haven't even looked at the different brands or they haven't even done any comparison shopping. Well, that's not your problem. That's theirs, right? You're only responsible for kind of um, uh, giving the information that a reasonable person, a reasonable customer would need. And if a person is sort of below that level, that's not your problem. And if they're above that level, you know, it is the gamer that's coming in or the wine professional that's coming in and they need the information. Well, you, you, ha you probably have to answer their questions, you know, if they ask you, but you don't have to go and actually um, anticipate what they're going to need to know and make sure you've checked off all those boxes for them. And that's, remember, the real question, because we're asking from the point of view of the salesperson who wants to know, all right, well, how much do I need to make sure that my customer knows so that I'm doing, I'm fulfilling my ethical obligations? And the same thing applies to sort of really detailed technical information. I already basically covered that. Um, the last thing to say here uh, is remember he said, you're, you're justified on going off of this reasonable person standard until a particular deviation becomes important. And basically what he means by this is that if it becomes clear to you in interacting with this uh, customer that for her to have a to engage in a voluntary exchange, uh, for her to you know make a decision about whether or not this product is in her interest to buy, um, if if that becomes clear to you that she needs some additional piece of information, well, you have to give that to her. So. Holly gives actually an interesting example in the, the paper about a real estate agent, right? Uh, and somebody who uh, at, wants to know about sort of whether the, uh, the neighborhood is like particularly noisy. So it, suppose you're selling houses, you're a real estate agent, and you know that um, the neighbors of this house that you're selling, uh, they have loud parties on the weekends, right? Well, most of the time, uh, most reasonable ho home buyers aren't going to need to know that, right? You, if they really care about, you know, finding a house where the neighbors are always quiet or, you know, whether or not there's parties on the weekends, well, you'll, they'll either ask you or, you know, they'll roll on up at, you know, 12 o'clock on a Friday and see what it sounds like. 
right? So the reasonable person isn't going to need to know that kind of thing, right? You, the reasonable person is going to need to know stuff like, are they going to build a freeway three blocks down? Or is it right next to an airport? Or is it on top of a former landfill or a toxic waste dump, right? Those are all things that any consumer is going to need to know before they can buy that home. Now, if somebody comes in, you know, comes to you and they, they're like, you know, it's really clear that they are trying to move someplace that's quiet at night. You know, they're like, oh, I hate where I live right now. There's constant parties. There's all these bars. I just want to be someplace quiet. Um, if you know that about this customer, um, even if she doesn't straight up ask, are the neighbors around here quiet? Well, that's the kind of particular deviation, I think, that Holly is talking about. So if it becomes clear to you as, a, as the seller um, that this person needs this bit of information, well, you need to give them that information. But until that happens, you're justified at just sticking with basically what the reasonable person that you would deal with is going to need to know in order to determine what, uh, whether or not the transaction is actually going to be in their interest. And then the next uh, lecture, we'll talk about some worries one might have about this kind of position.